in the recruiter and the interviewer. I know the interviewer you're oh. going to meet them in the room, but who necessarily is the recruiter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it just depends on the size of the organization. The recruiter works in HR. The interviewer is somebody who you will be working with. So the recruiter is just there to make sure the job gets filled. And then after you get the job or someone gets the job, the recruiter is no longer involved in this. Everyone else is, in, is a, like a formal interviewer for me. Great. Okay. I think we said uh, Ilakura. Am I saying your name well? Hello. How do I say your name? Basically, I think you got the correct pronunciation. Right. Yeah. Did you have a question? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, but this is my first time. Yes. Yeah, so I ah. don't know if the question has already been answered in the previous session. So I want to ask. Hello. Go ahead. Can you hear me? I think I have a question. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So this guy, there was a question I asked in the Slack group. So take for instance. Um, we are just getting into the industry as data scientists. And some of us might not really have that experience of working in a large organization. So we are coming out from 10 Academy and basically 10 Academy courses have been like, the weekly challenge has been okay, do this, do this. You have to plot this graph, you have to use this stuff. And, but when you get into the industry, it's not really like that. Like you just have to get in there and start doing something. So how can we like approach this kind of problem? So, we, I know that um, 10 academic courses or the nuclear challenges are quite technical, but how do you, or how can someone just get in, into a company and just start doing wonders and doing something that's very nice? So I don't know if you can just share some light on it, but I believe you are coming from the data analyst um, trap and then you have had some experience working as the data analyst. So how do you tackle problems, or how did you tackle problem in your first Okay, so Ilikora, I'm glad you joined us. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm going to say that that question has been answered a lot um, in the in the recordings. So I, I want you to go and take a look at the recordings. We talked in the, about a, many different aspects of how to navigate an organization in a in a business environment, um, including networking, um, trying to understand real problems, decision making, understanding what is the decision being made, and how are you going to influence the decision, how to relate to managers. So we've talked about a lot of these different aspects. I want you to go and first take a look at some of the recordings before I answer this too in deep, uh, too deeply. Um, but the number one thing I would tell you is that when you are entering into a job, especially your first job, you only have one responsibility. Does anyone know what your responsibility is? And this doesn't matter if you're a data scientist or a janitor. What is your number one responsibility after you get the job? Hello. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead and take a guess. Okay. Yeah, I think you asked me the question, right? I'm, a I'm answering it, but very briefly. What is the number one responsibility? Should I answer? Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think as a data scientist, your role is basically to get No, sorry. Data. You're already wrong. Because I said, it doesn't <laughs> matter. It doesn't matter what your job is, right? You have one job. And, and again, this is not the way it should be. This is the way it is. Um, um, we call me Kuali. Wow, I, I can't believe I'm struggling on that. And your name, my little son. Me uh, Kuali says in the chat, research on the organization and your job. Um, so those are so two things you're naming. Um, that's, and I would say like your job is basically what I'm asking. You. What is your job, right? Research on the organization we talked about in a separate conversation around networking. You should always be studying your organization outside of your work. Um, that helps you get more preeminence and um, appreciation within the business and usually means you get better projects at the company. So that's a great researching your organization even after you get hired is very, very good. Um, but that to me is your side job. That's one of your side jobs. So uh, Kevin says, follow the instructions given. I think that's you're on the right track now, Kevin. That's right. We're moving in the right direction. So the, the short answer is, your number one job, um, we call it another great answer, get, things, get to know how things flow. Your number one job is to make your manager happy. That's your number one job. Not the way it should be, that's the way it is. Your manager is happy with what you're doing, great. Now, 
understand as a data scientist, you're going to be working with many different people. You're going to be working with your manager who's either going to be a data scientist or a technical person. And you're going to be working with the heads of different parts of the business who want to understand the data you have access to, who want your analysis. If those people are happy and your manager is unhappy, if you make your manager look stupid and you help other people learn, you have not done your job. You've caused yourself a lot of heartache. So your number one job is to make your manager happy. How do you make your manager happy? Uh, Kevin and, and we Ali are on the right direction here. Um, follow the instructions that your manager gives you. Um, get to know how things flow. Um, make sure you understand how your manager thinks. For me, one of the key items is if I can imagine how my manager would tackle any problem, I'm 90% of the way there to knowing how to keep him happy, right? Or keep her happy. If she is going to um, talk to one of our internal clients, that is one of the directors of the other parts of the organization in a certain way, I wanna to try to talk in that same way, um, or I wanna talk in a way that supports how my manager talks. So that's all navigating politics and being really successful. But ultimately, it is actually your job. It is your number one job is for them to be happy. Now, fascinatingly enough, you might be incredibly bad at your data science capabilities, and it doesn't matter if your manager is happy. You are coming out of college. I would not expect you to know anything meaningful, right? I think you know some stati uh, statistics. I think you maybe know a little bit of systems. Hopefully, you have some computer science or engineering understanding, and you have some math understanding. But I don't really expect you as an entry level hire to get running and do things from the get going. But if you keep me happy, I will train you, right? And my job as your manager is to make sure you're doing enough work that your salary is afforded. It is worth it for you to be paid your salary. So Ilakur, I hope that that's helpful. I answered that more than I wanted to. I, I always talk. Yes, about thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, awesome. OK, so no. me, Kali, yeah. Thank you, Elikor, for the, yeah. the question. And yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and please go check out the recordings because we get into a lot of other things in some of the recordings. Um, Mwikali and Rahel, sorry, Rahel and then Mwikali. Um, and then after those two, we're going to switch into the flow for the rest of the session. We will be ending at 8.30 my time. Uh, which I believe is like 6.30, I want to say, in Ethiopia and 4.30 in Nigeria. Um, I think you all, you all understand what I'm going for, but about 80 minutes from now. So, Rahel, go ahead. What questions do you have? Okay, hi. Hey, how's it going? I'm good. So, uh, my question is about... Uh... The thing you were talking about note taking earlier ah. so yeah and you have actually written a, written a lot of notes with your girlfriend and uh, that's right i actually feel like it's too much <laughs> and, uh, yeah my question is like how do you actually balance between um, when you're taking a note and when you're like uh, listening to the person how do you balance between uh, understanding it and living it actually and because when you usually take a note, it, it looks like work, it, it sounds like uh, pressure and you don't remember it unless you just go to that note and uh, check that note. But if you just listen, you will, you'll just leave it and you will remember it like more often. So how do you actually balance between uh, those? Yeah. yeah, that's a great point. That's absolutely a great point. So first I wanna say is um, most people don't take enough notes, right? When we talk about balance, balance is finding something in the middle um, most people are at the end of taking almost no notes. So this answer I'm giving on how to find balance, for most people, the answer is start taking notes, right? Um, for people who take too many notes, which there are many people like me who have learned to take a lot of notes, um, the way that I've tried to move towards balance and, and make sure that I'm actually in, emotionally engaging is, is around connection. If I feel like I have a connection with the person, and I can feel that kind of connection in me. And I also can, I can understand that they feel connected to me in the conversation. I know that I'm doing, I'm in balance. And then I'm, I'm focused on taking notes that help me process. So my notes are actually not just focused on recording. Um, some notes will be about like recording so I remember in the future, but they're actually more about processing. 
um, if I hear the person speaking something and they said some, you know, right now I'm speaking about 200 words in a, in a chunk, right? Maybe even more. There's no way I expect you to remember all 200 words I said, right? So in this case, I really hope that you're taking notes and you've got maybe at least three bullet points for every 200 words I say, right? And you don't need to capture the entire thing of what I said, but just get like a key word, one or two key words. So you know that you hit each item or you're hearing each item. So what I'm looking for when I'm taking notes for myself is more of a of sort of an anchor for the recording side. Let me be able to come back to this or processing. They just said a lot to me and I have all these ideas coming up and I want to be able to focus on what they're saying. So let me just write something down to get my ideas out of my mind. Um, and that sort of helps me stay connected in the conversation. Um, and then the final thing I'm looking for on my processing piece is what happens next? I'm always trying to move, move us forward, right? What happens next? So either that's a next action for a future meeting, or that's something I want to bring up in this conversation to sort of address what we're going to do next. So right now, for example, as I say that out loud, I remember that I haven't done the meditation. So I'm writing down meditation. I'm just writing one word, right? I'm not writing anything else, just writing meditation down. And then I'm writing down Upwork, and then I'm, I'm realizing, okay, well, I've got more notes in Notion. So as I'm talking to you here, I'm actually gonna pull up my, my online, Notion is my online note-taking tool. I've just opened it up. I realize I don't have a section for writing notes for today's lesson. So I'm just making that session quickly. And you know, I'm doing all of this. I've like sort of practiced a, a, um, a skill of every time I'm in a conversation, includes in your interviews, by the way, everyone, Every time I'm in a conversation, I have at least 10% of my brain is thinking about what is the, how is this conversation going and what needs to happen in this conversation in order for it to be successful. In my interviews, one of the things that often will get missed or there won't be enough time for is that sort of emotional connection. So I'm trying to think about what is something I can sort of bring up that might connect us emotionally. If I know anything about the person, I have that in the back of my head. Um, if I have my notes, I've actually written it down. Um, sometimes in an interview environment, it's not comfortable to actually bring a piece of paper in. Um, so I'm actually just thinking about that. But ideally, I actually have it written down on my piece of paper. I'm gonna remember to ask them. If they tell me anything personal, often when people are running late or when they're walking in, they'll say something like, I was just with my kids or my son just did X, Y, and Z. So when I'm leaving, I wanna actually bring that back up. I wanna comment on that because I want to help us build a relationship, right? So I want to you know, say, oh, you know, I hope you have fun with your child, right? Or say, um, oh, so how old is your son? And you know, how do you balance work and life? You know? And so want to keep it professional if I'm in an interview setting, so I'm going to still bring it about work, but I want to give a chance to create, create that relationship. All this stuff shows up in my notes. By the way, I don't always take notes when I'm talking to my girlfriend. Yesterday we were having a like, serious conversation and I wanted her to know I was really hearing her, right? So that's that's a time where I'm definitely gonna be taking notes. Um, so yeah, great question. Is that helpful, uh, Rahel? Yes, it was. All right, great. And then Mwikali. Hello, so I have a follow-up question from last week. After practicing the whole reflective listening, I came to notice it reaches a point if the questions are like a lot and it becomes a bit repetitive. So what other technique would you suggest someone to use? Great, so I'm, I'm hearing you say with the reflective listening, you've noticed that when you're repeating back what someone says, it can sound repetitive in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Did you notice I just used reflective listening there? Yes. Um, but I didn't use it earlier with Rahel, right? So if I'm in connection, I'm not going to use it, right? Especially when I'm just starting to talk with somebody, I'm probably going to use it. So I'm how much I use it as part of the technique, right? Um, my recommendation right now as you're learning the technique, do it a lot and let it be a little awkward because it will be awkward. Think about the first time you started walking. Think about a baby when they're first walking. Are they trying to walk cool with that swagger? No, there's no baby who's got a swagger, right? They're just trying to make it to the couch. 
So you're just getting started. I want you to really just try to see if you're able to reflect back what people are saying um, and just keep practicing that. Um, when you're, uh, it can get a little awkward for the other person um, if they're not used to it. So there's a few ways to make it less awkward. And I'm not answering your question yet because I, I really want you to, to use this technique. It's just so helpful. Um, and then I will answer your question. So, but to make reflective li listening less awkward, um, there's a few phrases I like to use to make it clear that I'm about to reflect things or to make it more comfortable that I used reflective listening. Um, one of the phrases I like to use is, I want to make sure I understood what you said. Uh, did you say, did you mean, right? So I want to understood, I want to make sure I understood what you said. That phrase is a great intro into reflective listening. I want to make sure I, uh, I am getting it. I want to make sure this, uh, that I answer your question. You say any of those and then you ask, did you mean, and then you say what the reflection, right? And then in terms of reflections, you can do them in different levels. So you can do a reflection that is very detailed. You go, boy, by every single point they said, if they said 200 words, you say 200 words, right? That's usually unnecessary, right? And then you can do a very broad reflection. If they say 200 words, you try to hit just the key points and you might say 10 words back, right? So you want to try to aim that. And you might not even not do, and sorry, you might also do a reflection where if they said 200 words, you just focus on the last things they said. Because often people are sort of thinking out loud as they speak, right? So if you just focus on the last part of what they said, you might actually be able to get what they really want you to respond to. Or somebody might have taken a meandering route. They might start talking and they might go all over the place. And by the end of what they've said, you know, they said all kinds of stuff. But you know that they, when they started speaking was when they, were, they had the first immediate reaction to whatever you did or what, whatever was happening, right? So you might just come back to that very first part, right? So all this is, is stuff that you will get into as you sort of practice your skillfulness on reflective listening. So again, my recommendation is keep practicing it because it is an incredibly valuable skill. I can't tell you just how much is done for my girlfriend and I, but also in my business life, um, in pretty much in every environment I've been in, in almost every relationship I've been in, and especially in conflicts. And when I've done mediation, by the way, when I mediate people in conflict, if I support one person by just reflecting, even though I'm not the person they're fighting with, even though I'm not the person they want to have understanding what's happening, they want their, their partner, they want their business partner to understand. But just because I reflected it to them, they feel more at ease. You can feel them relax, let go of that anger or frustration, whatever it is. Um, you can feel them feel clear about what they're asking. By the way, your interviewers are human. They're not perfect. A lot of your interviewers will ask you a question that doesn't make sense, right? The words they're saying might not make sense. Your job is to help them feel good and to help them know that you're understanding them. So they have something in their mind that makes sense, but whatever they said may not make sense. So your ability to reflect back will save a bad interviewer, right? And will therefore save you in the interview. So things to keep thinking about. Um, now, if you don't wanna use reflective listening in any moment, um, other ways to do empathy where you're actually understanding um, one technique I, I like to use the invisible shelf. So I keep in my mind, and I do this when I'm doing reflective listening as well. In my mind, there's a shelf, sort of like this black shelf that's behind me, but this one's invisible. It's right over here. And if I have an idea or I have a suggestion, I have a thought that comes in my mind and the other person is speaking, I'm not going to be listening to them anymore because now I'm stuck in my thought. So this is to Rahel's point, right? I want to stay in connection with them. So I put this on my invisible shelf. Often my notepad acts as my invisible shelf. Um, but if I don't have a notepad, which you might not have in many of your interviews, I have my invisible shelf and I just put my idea there. It doesn't mean I've thrown it away. It doesn't mean I'll never return to it. I'm just putting it on the shelf. And so just visualizing that shelf and just being like, okay, here's my feeling. Here's my idea. Often when people are speaking, we like to immediately decide, do I agree with them? Are they right? Don't bother on figuring out if they're right or wrong. Just understand what they're saying. So put whether or not you agree, put it on the shelf. 
understand what they think. You can decide later if you agree with them. But first, you need to understand what they're saying. If you think you understand what they're saying and you hear that they're saying item A, but they really are saying item B, and now you want to talk about item A, you completely miss what they're doing, right? And your, any thoughts you have are irrelevant because they're trying to talk about number, uh, letter B, and you're over here talking about letter A. Does that make sense, Mukali? All right, awesome. Great questions, everybody. Okay, so we are already 20 minutes in. We've got about 70 minutes left. With that, we're, not, we're going to jump into the meat of our session. And because uh, everyone asked, um, uh, I want, and Kevin's saying he underestimated the power of empathy. I appreciate that, Kevin. Yes, very powerful. Uh, because everyone's asked, um, I want to uh, do the meditations again. Um, give me a thumbs up if you still want to do a meditation. All right, great. We got a big thumbs up from Kevin. Anyone else want to do meditation? If, if we've only got one or two people, then I will skip it. Okay, great. We've got a good number of people there. All right. I know some of you are not raising your thumbs. Uh, for you, if you don't want to participate in the meditation, don't, you don't need to participate. Um, feel free to, to do something else. Maybe take a few notes on what you'd like to hear about today. Um, and with that, I'll ask you to find a comfortable seated position and uh, either close your eyes or look down. So draw your attention to your belly, to your stomach, and just notice your breath. Notice how your stomach rises and falls as you are breathing. Breathing in, I know that I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I know that I'm breathing out. And then as you continue to breathe, just repeat on the in-breath, in. And as you exhale, out. In, out. As you're focusing on your breath, a thought might come up, a feeling might come up, that's okay. We just recognize our thoughts, our feelings. Oh, look, that's a thought. And then we return our attention back to our breath. In, out.
As I'm breathing in, I notice my breath is becoming deep. As I'm breathing out, I notice my breath is becoming slow. On my in-breath, I'll repeat deep. And on my out-breath, I'll repeat slow. Deep. Slow. You do not need to force your breath, just notice. And to wrap up the meditation, um, I say something uh, similar to a prayer. May, may everyone in the world be at ease. May everyone in the world be at peace. And may everyone in the world be happy. All right, thanks everyone for joining me in that. Feel free to come back in the space, turn your cameras back on. We've got a few more people joining us as well. All right, so now I want to move and to, oh yeah, let me see here. Um, how many people tried that and enjoyed it? Wonderful, wonderful. All right, at least two people. That's great. <laughs> um, we are now in, is this week 11, everyone? Wow, how time flies. You're almost done. Soon you will be an adult. I'm joking, you have been an adult all this time. Um, so I think where we left last time is that uh, people wanted to hear about Upwork and on thoughts on how to get um, Upworking jobs. Um, and I think we also did not talk about how to um, do the sales approach to getting a job. So those are the two things I wanna focus on today. If you have other questions, other things you want me to talk about, put them in the chat. And I'm going to see if I can sort of incorporate them, incorporate them as I go. But the two things I'm going to focus on today is how to prepare your job hunting efforts um, and how to think about applying to jobs on Upwork. Um, and yeah, some, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Upwork. Upwork is going to be more of a discussion, I think, um, because I'm not an expert in it. And I have some experience hiring people. And I I don't remember if I've ever actually gotten a job from Upwork, but I have hired people from Upwork. Um, and then, um, but the job hunting spreadsheet, I've, I've got some good information for you. So let me first pull up my own job hunt spreadsheet. Let's see if I can do that. All right. And actually while I'm doing this, can people write in the chat um, has, did anyone, oh, actually, you know what? Let's do it this way. Let's do a quick breakout. Let's take five minutes. I want each of you to talk with each other and uh, talk about what is your job hunting approach? 
So how are you organizing your job hunting if you're organizing it or just how are you doing it, how you're going about it? So this is your question. How are you, or what is your job hunting approach? Everyone got the question? Any, any questions? Thanks, David. See that thumb. Any questions about what the question is? All right. You'll have five minutes. I would love to hear you talk. I would love for you to come back and tell me what you talk about, but make sure to talk to one another about what is your job hunting approach. And I'll see you here in five minutes. Hi, Brian. I think you, I just move you to a new room. So if you hit the breakout room button, you should be able to go to the new room. Okay, okay. I mean, yeah, that's it's certain that we can use more time. We'll have more time at the end. When we end the session, you'll have more time to talk with each other, um, although you'll end up talking to somebody different. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd love to hear from you all. Um, what were things that came up as you were talking? And yeah, I really recommend messaging each other on Slack um, if, if you had a good conversation and you want to keep talking, uh, take a moment right now and message each other. I also would love to hear from some folks, especially people who have not talked yet. Um, what um, is uh, something that you discussed? Yeah, go ahead. I'd like to go. Um, so Rafi and I discussed First of all, we first put into perspective how a job searching and a job search hunt was going before Ten Academy and how it has differed since our introduction to Ten Academy. So for me, it was um, one, I created a spreadsheet with the, a link to the opportunity I've applied to, or like a basic description of the opportunity. And then I have in my Google Drive, I have the, my, the resume, but with each opportunity, I try, try to make a different, like just customize it to the job description, put in the, the keywords from that. And then I track if I put a res, if I, if I received any feedback, if I didn't, then I get back to the company. And yeah, that's what I use. Um, um, Rofia said for her that she, she actually now looks at the job description itself, like completely, she goes through it all and then she makes sure that she has at least 70% and then she proceeds to apply, which has differed for her because she never used to look at the complete job description, the complete requirements. Yeah. 
You're on mute, Idris. Thanks, Noam. Um, so and now she's looking at the entire thing, where before she was not looking at the entire job description. Yeah, great, great. Um, anyone else want to share? Let's hear from at least two more people. Yeah, can I go? So uh, we have discussed with uh, Abu Bakr and uh, so I think there are two basic approaches that we can follow. One advocates qual quality of the proposals and one advocates the quantity of the proposals. So the first approach is, you know, you're going to get as many, many, many uh, job postings that match your specific skills. But, you know, you can uh, have a generic proposal that uh, lays out all your skills and why you should get a job in that specific uh, uh, job type. But, uh, you know, those kinds of generic, appro uh, generic proposals are not that effective. So, but you can have as many as you want. You can, all you can, all you need to do is just copy and paste and uh, you know, send your proposals to as many job posts that you like. And the second approach is very targeted and doing some research on uh, the company or the type, the the one who posts the, uh, the job, and you know, coming uh, coming up with a very specific job proposal that matches that specific job only. So on that case, you're not going to have as many proposals a day, but uh, you're going to have a few uh, more uh, quality and effective job proposals. So I usually prefer going with the second one because uh, given the um, amount of competition for every job posting, because we're, when freelancing, the scope is as large as the entire world. So I think coming up with uh, more effective and quality proposals that match only that specific uh, job post will yield better results. Thank you. Wonderful, thanks Noam. So um, there's a, this consideration of quality versus quantity. More time I put into a proposal, less proposals I get out, more proposals I get out. Um, it, there, you might change my um, likelihood of success, but the quality might impact the likelihood of success as well. So we're balancing this consideration. Um, something we can talk about a little bit more in a second. Great. Um, let's hear from one more person. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, actually, this course is Good The funny thing is that we are in the same project group. And also today is our first time of joining your session. <laughs> so I think you know, I should be laughing now. Where they actually talk about his, uh, his plans, how he has already applied for jobs on Upwork and signing up on Upwork and within for week 13, actually starts applying for a for job. So basically I think Biniam has an outside and it's actually good. Okay, so I, I only caught, I only heard that you've started applying uh, um, on Upwork and, um, uh, and that's been your main, main approach to getting jobs so far. Um, yes, 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 yes. Wonderful. Okay, great, thanks. Um, great, so I wanna come back to what Muyu, what, what Muyu talked about, about a spreadsheet. Um, I think spreadsheets uh, keep us organized and if you build them well, um, can really, uh, uh, just really make each, how do you say, make you focused, even though you're going through quantity of applications and uh, you can get a lot done. So let me see if I can open a spreadsheet. All right. So um, has anyone heard of um, Disney World? Um, believe it or not, I have the contact information for the person in people analytics at Disney World. Well, I had at least about three years ago when I was doing my job hunting, um, but I didn't look at only Disney World. I actually looked at about 114 companies. So this was my spreadsheet. We got the company name, the first name of the contact person I'm talking to, last name, 
um, the status of my outreach. This, this column is the most important column. What is the status? You'll, we'll, I'll show you a new template after this, and I've cleaned up how I use status. Um, but I want to be able to quickly filter and, and see you know, what, what is next. If I have follow-ups, right? I need to follow up with a recruiter. I need to follow up with an individual. I need to contact somebody. I want to, I will always filter by that, right? To manage that. Um, and I got immediate action requests and whatnot, and, and then a bunch of information and a lot of information will change over time. So I was managing this because I had originally gotten all the information from a database. When you are going into contracting, I, uh, you will have to be doing a lot more outreach. You are really in the sales game. And this was when I was doing only consulting. So you'll see, we basically picked the largest companies in the area. Um, and I landed one of these clients, by the way, um, but we went through a hundred clients to get one. Um, so it takes a lot more effort, a lot more time um, when you're doing contracting work. And there's something to keep in mind, um, but you will go through different stages with them and, and track that. So anyways, just wanted to give you an example of something that looks a little bit larger. Uh, let me give you a different one now. I'm going to give you the one I'm starting to build out. Uh, let's see. I apologize, I have too many tabs open, so it might take me a second to find it. Okay, and I'm not finding the one I was hoping to share, but this is pretty close. Um, so one of the things I also like to track is the priority. This is to Nahom's point of how much effort am I going to put into this job posting? Um, I wanna make sure that high priority jobs get my attention, but I also wanna make sure that I put myself out there for low priority jobs because not a lot of people might be applying to these jobs and there might be some really great opportunities out there. So if all of us are applying to Disney World, then Disney World is going to get one really great person. And if none of us apply to that one food company that very few people know the name of, they might not have a lot of applicants. So I wanna make sure that I'm at least getting out the, you know, I'm, I'm at least getting out the application um, and every once in a while, while I'm looking at the job, I might find out that, hey, this is not a good fit for me. Um, for me, I'm looking at people analytics um, leadership roles. So I'm actually starting the team or I'm trying to manage the team. So for me, you know, it's a little different from what you're applying to. I expect you not to really have any places where you're not able to continue applying, um, especially for your first jobs. Um, later on, you'll have a lot more clarity around what jobs are, are really suited for you and not. But early on, um, you know, just really you're looking to just finish applying. One of the things that you don't see on this one that you see on the sales tracking sheet, when you don't have a lot of, when you're, when you're out there and you're trying to pursue a lot of people, I like to keep track of a column, which is the next, uh, next step date. And so you can filter on this date. So if the next step is um, the 30th uh, for this and the 29th for this and the 28th for this, every day I should just be coming into the sheet and I should just sort, right? And then I know immediately, where do I get started? Sometimes I wanna give the recruiter three days to get back to me. Sometimes I'm, the interview is not for a week. And I'm going to prepare for the interview three weeks from now. Or sorry, three days from now, not three weeks from now. Uh, I'm going to give. I'm not going to prepare for the interview too far in advance. I'm going to prepare just a few days before the interview, right? So, depending on how you're managing it, having a spreadsheet is helpful. Um, how many jobs does everyone need to get accepted to?
How many jobs do all of you need to get accepted to? Can, can somebody come off mute and tell me? I see Kevin writing one in the chat. How many jobs do you need? Rahel is saying one, Rafaya is saying one. Ida is asking me why. Maybe one and some light side gigs. Great, a lot of ones. Um, so if you only need one, how many rejections can you stomach? If you only need one, how many rejections can you stomach, right? You're basically guaranteed to get a job if you can handle hundreds of rejections. It's very, it, it's very hard to imagine you not getting something, right? Now your, what your priorities might be might shift. You might become more open to taking more jobs than you were beforehand, but if you're, as you get more rejections, but if you only need one, then it's really important that you're actually putting yourself out there a lot. The reason spreadsheets are really powerful is it keeps you focused and it keeps you motivated. It keeps reminding you that there's a lot of opportunities every time you get a rejection. So now how many people have a spreadsheet? I know Wamuyu has a spreadsheet. Who else has a spreadsheet? Um, let me know if you don't have a spreadsheet. How many people don't have a spreadsheet and are thinking of making one or don't have one, don't know if they're ready? Great, Ida's planning on making one. See a thumbs up from your home. Ken is using boards. Ken, are you using physical boards or are you using some um, like online Trello board? I use, I use a... Uh, the, the Asana. Great. You're using Asana. Wonderful. Great. People are making one. Uh, Jeanette doesn't have one. Um, so for all of you, if you don't have one, um, you're, I really recommend you make one. Um, and then the attributes I want everyone to have, I want you to have the job, the name of the company, job title, category of job. Uh, and actually, I should put this in the Google document. You know what, I'm going to switch over to the Google document. And all of you can see me typing this in there. And actually, if, if somebody can volunteer to help me with the note taking, appreciate all of you being flexible with the disorganization, remembering that fortunately, I don't have as much time as I would like to prep for our sessions. Oh, and I hear there's a guest talk in at the top of the hour. Um, thank you for telling me that. Um, so then I, I want to encourage you all to be going to these guest talks. So then we'll end, we'll actually end at eight. Um, or we'll end in a few minutes. Did not realize the guest talk was, was scheduled now. Um, I'll make sure to, to make sure that we, we try to schedule these for 90 minutes instead of um, one hour. So um, let's do this. Let me switch over then. If we're already at a guest talk, um, can um, I'm going to type in a few different attributes um, for your spreadsheet. Um, when will you please feel free to put your own, anyone else who is using a board um, like Ken or using um, your own spreadsheets, please, please feel free um, to add your spreadsheets uh, attributes so people know what you're putting in. And by the way, my answer is you need only one job, but you need um, two to three offers, two to three companies saying they're ready to hire you. You don't want to be stuck with only one choice. Um, also, if you have two to three offers, that's how you negotiate. Kevin asked earlier, how do we negotiate salary? If I have multiple offers, it's very easy to negotiate. 
If I only have one offer, it puts me in a tough spot. Um, how you manage the timing of that can be a little complicated, which is why it's really valuable to do this all at once. You want to get into a job hunting mode and you want to apply to a lot of jobs. And you want to apply well to a lot of jobs. So if you do that, ideally, as you finish up different interview cycles, you'll get the offers around the same time. Um, we can talk more about how do you navigate that kind of stuff in a future session. And um, with that, we've got five minutes left. So I'm going to give you the feedback link for today's session. I know we were all over the place and we didn't talk about Upwork this time. Let's talk about Upwork next time. I'm going to give you one tip for Upwork. Um, the, when I was hiring people on Upwork, I was looking at two things. How expensive is this person? If they're cheap, I can pay them. And I can just try it out. If I don't like working with them, I can stop. If I like working with them, I can offer them a lot more, right? Even if they raise their rate and they say there's an introductory rate, um, then I can actually pay them initially. And then if it works out, pay them more. So first, if it's cheap, I can try them. Second, if they have really good reviews, if they have very good reviews, um, I have an interest in working with them and I'm willing to pay more. So as you're getting started and you have zero reviews, first try to take easy jobs that you can actually do really well at and to get your first few jobs, charge almost nothing. On Upwork, it's hard to tell if somebody's first five jobs were something else. Most people hiring won't check. So if you start with a few jobs that are easy to do and you do them really well, you make sure that your customer is really happy, your client is really happy, you can get better ratings. Then people will actually look at your profile. When I'm hiring for a job where I'm gonna spend a couple hundred dollars, not gonna hire anybody who doesn't have at least a, a, like five or 10 reviews where they had four stars and above. So that's my, my take as somebody who, who has hired people from Upwork. We can talk more about that and have a bigger discussion um, next week on that. And um, with that, I, I'll ask everyone to fill out the survey. And um, I'll let you take, I'm going to send you into breakout rooms. And uh, you can spend the last three minutes um, talking with whoever you meet um, about, I want you to answer the question, what was helpful? and what you want to talk about next week. And if you can actually send, put that in the Slack, um, put those, the answers to that in Slack after you've talked about it in the breakout room, that would be really great for me. And I'm right now gonna recreate these rooms and send you all the breakouts. All right, bye everybody. I'll see you next week.